Shane here. Thanks for tuning in to Liberty Under Attack Radio. We've got a very special podcast for you today. This was initially recorded on November 4th, so we're going back a little into the past, but I still think the information found within is extremely relevant. More specifically, Kyle Reardon and I uh, will debunk any notion that jury nullification was the reason for the not guilty verdicts granted to the members of Citizens for Constitutional Freedom up in Oregon recently. But before I turn you over to the conversation we had, there are a few announcements, one of them being uh, <laughs> quite a major one. For those of you who strictly listen to the archives and not the live show, this will be completely irrelevant for you, but it never hurts to be informed anyways. As of right now, November 17th will be the last live broadcast on the Freedom Phalanx radio network. Hopefully not permanent, but uh, we'll just have to see. I'd like to thank Ryan, Mr. Producer from FPRN, for all that he has done for LUA. He has been extremely loyal and has gone over and beyond in making us feel at home uh, and in helping us produce a quality live broadcast. Hell, there may not have even been an LUA radio if it wasn't for all the help that he provided in getting us started. I've gotten to know him quite well over the uh, past almost two years, and if there is a demand for a future live broadcast, there is no other place that we will go. Doge knows I don't have the patience to deal with all that tech shit anyways. I also hope this decision will lead to a larger listener base that we can then bring back to FPRN. That is the hope, but at this point it is pure speculation. So what is the reasoning for this decision? Well, to put it simply, we have maybe gotten a handful of call-ins in almost two years, and 95% of our audience listens via the archives. With a podcast, on the other hand, I can pre-record shows whenever I get the itch, and I can save a lot, save a lot of money in the process. Uh, and probably more content as well. It's really a no-brainer. So, thanks again, Ryan, for all that you have done. We certainly won't forget it, and we'll continue to point people in your direction if they are looking for a live network. That said, if you want to uh, help ease our anxiety when it comes to this major decision, financial support is always appreciated. We accept one-time PayPal and Bitcoin donations, the latter being preferred, as the fees are significantly lower. And, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the other reason I'm going to keep to myself for security culture purposes, but you can imagine what I'm alluding to. Just visit LibertyUnderAttack.com and use the buttons on the sidebar. Very, very easy to do. They're right there at the top of the page. But uh, you can also just tell your friends and family about the show. Word of mouth has proven its efficacy over, well, the entire course of human history. We've covered plenty of topics, and there is certainly something that can interest uh, your desired audience, whether that be a friend, a family member, or just someone you come across on Fascist Book. Just visit tinyurl.com forward slash LUA archives. If you visit it now, it will just show the dates, but I will be going through there soon to provide an actual description, uh, some context as to what was discussed in the show. We certainly appreciate your patience. I think that's it. Uh, so please enjoy this discussion and uh, view the show notes for more information. <coughs> Kyle Reardon from uh, the Last Bastille blog is with me once again. Uh, hello, Kyle. Uh, long, long, time, long time no talk. I, I feel like we did this, uh, what, 24 hours ago? Something like that. <laughs> but uh, it's, always, it's always good to address uh, things that uh, may be uh, misunderstood by some people and try to clear everything up and remove the confusion. Yeah, and thankfully, I, I, I think tonight's uh, tonight's uh, little edition will. Uh, uh, it, it, there's no reason that it should offend people. We're just uh, trying to clarify a, a misconception. So I think we'll be a little better off than the one we did uh, uh, last night. But uh, a little context before uh, before we get into this, though. Uh, the occupation of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge uh, by the Citizens for Constitutional Freedom took place early this year. It was a 41-day occupation. From the very start, Liberty Under Attack documented the events uh, that took place. Uh, there's a special playlist on the YouTube channel specifically for that. Uh, you can find that very easily. Additionally, for some time, we provided transparency by making the court documents available. I uploaded hundreds upon hundreds for months. I, I didn't keep count, but I think I probably should because the, the amount that are, uh, that, that, uh, that are up there now is, is honestly uh, mind-blowing. Uh, but you can find that archive by visiting uh, tinyurl.com forward slash c4cfdocs, which I'll put uh, in the show description. Uh, but simply put, I got burnt out. That, and I was frustrated that an anarchist had to do this for the constitutionalist community. I shouldn't have had to. I really shouldn't have. Uh, that, and they, they should have taken the initiative and, uh, and, and done it themselves. Kyle and I also went on uh, Louis B's show, uh, Crotch Shot Radio, on two different occasions to fill in his listeners on, on what exactly was going on and what we thought would happen. And, uh, and honestly, Kyle, I mean, uh, 
I, I, I haven't listened to those broadcasts in a while, but I think uh, we were wrong on, on what we thought the outcome would be. I don't think we even even pondered the idea that they would get, they would uh, get off with a not guilty verdict. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. If I remember correctly, I think you and I were pretty, uh, I'll just use the word, pretty cynical. Yeah. Uh, because the odds were stacked against them, and um, the public opinion, at least in some sense, was at best divided and at worst uh, was pretty derisive. One example of which was, of course, the infamous Bundy Rodica. Yeah. Yeah, that that is definitely true. Comical, yes, but... Uh... Uh, and also, I mean, you, you can't discount the. I mean, I mean, you you, you can't say that uh, we were wrong in our opinion back then, uh, because you looked at uh, what was going on in, in the mainstream. I mean, I saw plenty of stuff saying, uh, "Why don't the Why isn't uh, the National Guard just going and kill him?" Uh, yeah, the the public opinion at that time was, I don't know, it didn't provide a very good outlook. But but I guess, but fortunately, they they aren't sitting in cages. Uh, at least some of them. Some of them have to go. Uh, I know the Bundys have to go to. Uh, uh, to Nevada to, to, to face their uh, their next set of charges, uh, but uh, uh, we'll just have to we'll just have to see what happens there. Uh, but yeah, I guess uh, it's safe to say that uh, Kyle and I, for oh God, for for we we spent a lot of hours on this subject, and we aren't going to go through every single uh, crucial detail like we have done in the past. Uh, but uh, we we definitely have some time uh, time in on this subject. All of that said, I think I should provide my position before going any further, and Kyle can provide his too. Uh, but I think our position is going to be pretty similar, but yeah, he definitely can provide his as well. Uh, but uh, the occupiers were performing direct action, civil defiance. They were there with guns. Uh, and I don't think that should be underestimated. They were also participating in reformism, though. They wanted to have meetings with the FBI, the sheriffs, and politicians. I mean, a lot of the videos on uh, the... Uh, 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 Pete Santilli's YouTube channel were them trying to meet with uh, meet up with these uh, government officials. And uh, as Kyle Rudd coined it, it was actually reformism plus. And uh, as per the trivia method, Kyle, would you mind uh, defining what reformism plus uh, is uh, to make it very, very explicitly clear? Sure. Reformism plus, I guess, is a shorthand term that means reformism plus direct action. Uh, to elaborate a little bit, for those, of, for those of you who understand reformism, essentially, if you have people who are using methods that, or otherwise a combination of methods, where they are sometimes working inside of the system in order to change it from within, but then some other methods they're doing are more along the lines of direct action, where they are exercising their freedom without asking for, for permission, this co-mingling of these two very different strategic viewpoints of, of how to do things and such, uh, I guess could be summed up as being reformism plus. It's, it's, inher it's inherently trying to put a, uh, a square peg through a round hole. Yeah. So anybody who tries to do that kind of thing, as I think is the case here with the uh, C4CF personnel, they really just kind of uh, miss the mark, unfortunately. And uh, last time I checked, I mean, their grievances uh, involve things about... Uh, you know, public land issues, a very vague concept. Hell, even earlier today, I put up on the blog uh, an excerpt from the United States Constitution annotated as published originally by the federal government's uh, government printing office, GPO, where essentially they did provide annotated summaries of the entire federal judiciary's uh, case precedent about Article One. Um, that that was the mil the military and enclave clause or something like that, right? Yeah, mil military. Yes, enclave and military okay. installations clause. Yes, uh, that clause seventeen uh, in that art uh, in in one of those sections. I don't remember the number right offhand, but yes, enclave and military installations clause, where it was basically about seceding or uh, ceding land uh, from the federal government to the states or vice versa or whatever. It's really convoluted, but the fact, but but to keep this very simple. The, it's kind of vague and ill-defined, and that's coming straight from the federal government. So yeah. in terms of like what C4CF's arguments were in terms of, well, we want the land at MNWR, uh, the birdcage, yeah, uh, ad, to go ad, back. Adverse, adverse possession, essentially, is, is what it came well, down to. Well, that, that don't even go that far, because some of the patriots have been disagreeing with each other about whether they Ooh. want to argue adverse possession or not. I mean, other ones are basically arguing that a lodial title should, should be transferred from the feds to uh, the Oregon government, too. So I wouldn't even go that far. 
Wow. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I, I'm not surprised. I'm definitely, I'm definitely oh, not surprised. Dave, oh, but... there's been some stuff behind <laughs> it. Well, I, I'll say this for the benefit of the listeners so they have an idea, but there are, I'm not at liberty to say who said what, but I will say this. That the constitutionalists behind the scenes have been very much bickering with each other about what the C4CF defendants should or should not be arguing. And uh, it's been very interesting. Some of it is min- Monday Night Quarterbacking. Others uh, are, are individuals who allegedly have some sort of indirect or direct contact with the defendants or their lawyers. It's just been a very interesting sideshow that no one's really, I don't think anybody's really mentioned this publicly yet. I guess I'm the first yeah. guy to whistleblow on it, I suppose. But yes, uh, the fact of the matter is that this whole thing's been a carnival sideshow. And, and yes, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, you and I, uh, when, when January occurred, like anything else you and I uh, or any of our uh, assorted allies and, um, and, and other folks that we work with, you know, peer to peer and all that, anything else we were doing, everything just got dropped, if you remember. Yep. Oh, no, it, so, it, it definitely did. Yeah, yeah. And the only respite we got was basically uh, those first two weeks in February when the final four were still there, but uh... <laughs> the, 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 no, nothing was really happening. We didn't know what was going on. We we were we were still we were still looking for information, but mm-hmm. there was there was just nothing. That was kind of the, I guess the calm before the storm. Whenever they the the, the final the four surrender. got taken in, yeah. And then the surrender, and then the actual surrender, which was the last bit of action, uh, occurred pretty much within arguably a thirty-six hour period. Yeah. And and then and then it was over up until well now where apparently there's actually been some not guilty verdicts which is which is what we're going to focus on here. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. You mentioned you mentioned before before we did this, and I I think we probably should have done this uh, for, for last night's, which is actually playing live on LUA Radio, LUA Radio right now while we're recording this, which is kind of <laughs> funny, but. Uh, <laughs> But regard, regarding the sovereign That's citizens, so I, I know it's, it's it's kind of odd, right? So I, I'm t- I, we're we're both talking at the same time in a different place. Uh, so meta, man. <laughs> so meta. But uh, uh, but yeah, you mentioned when when we're covering these reformism topics, and, and I should have done this from the start, but it kind of slipped my mind. Uh, but what we're doing, what we're kind of doing now is, I, I mean, it was uh, 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 Kyle's. Uh, uh, anthology and audiobook uh, called an elusive phantom of hope a critique of reformism uh it was methodological it was just something that these 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 methods of reformism whether it's voting running for office uh pro- protesting whatever wh- whatever method of reformism it is they just simply don't work and what we're doing with with some of these uh special editions is applying it to specific instances and uh just i mean further proof for you right kyle <laughs> well it's my hope that through editions and podcasts and whatever else such as these, that people will actually take my thesis of my first book and actually, you know, take it seriously so they can lower their own opportunity costs and, uh, you know, also maybe even do that uh, freedom umbrella of direct action, you know, thing that you've been promoting with vigor for uh, the better part of a year now at least. And, yeah. and that's kind of where my hope is, is that, you know, that, that little tiny things in the news cycle like, you know, these defendants got found innocent and people bickering about jury nullification. It's like, well, I hope they can find my book, which contains an entire chapter about where, I mean, it's literally entitled jury nullification does not work. And then maybe from there, actually get away from uh, both reformism plus as well as reformism and really focus more purely on direct action. That's, That's my hope for the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. And if you want to find that book, uh, the anthology and uh, uh, audiobook are both available at Liberty Under Attack. I think exclusively, right, Kyle? Yes, yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Uh, tinyurl.com forward slash reformism sucks. Pretty easy to remember. But again, tinyurl.com forward slash reformism sucks. You can find uh, you can find that there. So what what I, I guess the the plan for the, for the rest of this uh, this this short little podcast is uh, we're going to take a look at uh, uh, a transcript by juror number four who. Uh, I would presume is the uh, the the foreman. Uh, he was the one that uh, uh, removed. I think it was juror number eleven uh, from the jury uh, because of his bias. I noticed, and it was kind of, and this kind of worked out perfectly because this crosses ideological lines. Uh, I'm in an email list with constitutionalists, and they were claiming that it was jury nullification. And I saw on Facebook that a lot of, a lot of, a lot of those folks, a lot of my people, were were saying this was jury nullification when that's just simply not the truth. It's just not the truth. 
so what I want to do, and, and, and we can, we can, we can, I guess, debunk that within these first two paragraphs of this transcript. Uh, so we'll get, we'll go ahead and do that real quick, and then we, we can, we can kind of. Uh, just briefly, the, the, I guess there, there are just a couple points I, I, I want to make to to anarchists because there, there are quite a few of them that that that, that like the notion of journal Uh But we'll go straight to this to this transcript first. And again, this is from juror number four, and this was published on OregonLive.com. I'll put that link in the show notes. Uh, so his initial email quote: "It should be known." that all 12 jurors felt that this verdict was a statement regarding the various failures of the prosecution to prove conspiracy in the count itself, and not any form of affirmation of the defense's various beliefs, actions, or aspirations. Proving the elements of conspiracy, especially given the body of evidence we are forced to restrict ourselves to consider uh, when judging, was far too great a standard to meet without using our imagination, imaginations, prejudices, etc. And I'll read this next paragraph, and then uh, uh, it'll be it'll be pretty clear. Uh, quote, the, the judge floored us when she said that there was no statute against impeding federal officers by force, threat, or intimidation, nor was, there any, uh, nor was there a significant penalty applied to criminal trespass. We all queried about uh, alternative charges that could stick and were amazed that this conspiracy charge seemed the best possible option. It was not lost on us that our verdict, uh, singular or plural, might inspire future actions that are regrettable. But that sort of thinking was just was was not permitted when considering the charges before us. End quote. So, Kyle, there are two things that really stick out. I mean, they 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 wanted. I mean, they, they I guess uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but they they it seemed like the the jurors didn't like the actions that were taken, but they just couldn't. The the prosecution didn't their didn't do their job and and and. and in uh, prosecuting that and, and, and bearing their burden of proof. And then also in this last sentence in the second paragraph, quote, it was not lost on us that our verdict or verdicts might inspire future actions that are regrettable. There was no, there was no judging of, of the uh, validity of the, of, of the law at hand. It was just that the prosecution did not do their job. This was not jury nullification. It's just right there in those two paragraphs by juror number four, cut and dry, done. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and not only that, but also I, I think I agree with you. I think it's pretty clear here what what the foreman said. Uh, for but for those of those who may not be familiar with jury nullification, uh, what it is, uh, especially if this is the very first time they're hearing of it, because remember there yeah. are people that are kind of learning this stuff on the fly. I guess one working definition of jury nullification would be that jury nullification is the right and proper power of the jury to judge the law as well as the facts of the case brought before them for, adjudi for adjudication regardless of the judge's instructions. Yes. So obviously there is an issue of judging the facts of the case, you know, did the defendants do X, Y, Z versus, um, well, the defendants were charged with, uh, you know, all of these, this impressive sounding words of, you know, as actually in this particular case, it was conspiracy to injure or impede officers of the United States. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, okay, well, is that an unjust law? Now, if the jury had exercised their power of nullification uh, regarding the C4CF defendants, then what that would mean is that they would have adjudicated that the charge of conspiracy to injure or impede officers of the United States is an unjust law. That's what jury yeah. nullification would actually mean had that been the case here. But obviously, I don't think they did that at all. I think no. they stuck mainly to the facts of the case. You know, was there a conspiracy to injure or impede or not? You know, did the defendants do X, Y, Z? X, Y, B, Z being the, the conspiracy to injure or impede. And yeah. they adjudicated that, no, there was no conspiracy to injure or impede. So that is adjudicating based on the facts of the case, not based on the law that is, you know, the, the essentially the charges against the criminal charge against the defendants. So they didn't adjudicate that conspiracy to injure or impede officer of the United States is an unjust law. I mean, you have to keep in mind, jury nullification really works best for victimless crime type cases. For example, uh, like simple possession of cannabis. Uh, many people would even say possession of a uh, firearm by a felon. So, you know, the point is that there is no victim. Unfortunately, with conspiracy to injure or impede an officer of the United States, ah, correct me if I'm wrong, Shane, but I think there's probably an identifiable victim even in that so-called crime, isn't there? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I would say, I would say there, 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 uh, 
I guess technically from my anarchist perspective, there 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 is no there is no victim, but I, I think the government could claim that they were victims to uh the government that this this fallacious entity known as government could claim to be victims to to this crime. Well, it says officers right in the charge, conspiracy to injure or impede officers of the United States. That's a specifically that that's supposed to be a specifically identifiable individual. Let's say officer uh John Doe. Okay, specifically identifiable victim. Um, so as far as the prosecution arguing it, they were saying, well, there was this conspiracy to, to you know, use force, uh, you know, injure or impede. So, you know, anybody trying to argue that the charges in question are victimless crimes, that's going to be a bit of a stretch. And I don't think anybody ever argued that. And that's very important to keep in mind. I don't think anybody ever argued that in court. There's no reason to believe that unless somebody can get the trial transcripts and make that available so I can look at it because I'd like to see what happened. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon because we can't have judicial transparency, apparently. Yeah, and I got burnt out on it. And you know which constitutionalists are picking that up and, and taking, all, taking up that torch? I think I can probably count them on can... one hand or, wait, no, a fist because yeah, none of yeah, them are. Yeah. You don't need any hands to do that. <laughs> yeah, and isn't that quite sad? Whoa, 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 once, whoa, once, once I said, once, book. once I said, screw it, yeah, no more judicial transparency. You know, once the anarchists stop, uh, uh, speaking from, uh, you know, we believe in the Constitution. Once that anarchist stopped, stopped providing the transparency for our court documents, we decided it wasn't worth it. Yeah, but yeah, but notice <laughs> that they, you know they'll get on fascist book and claim that they love the Bundys. I remember people years ago saying they love Charles Dyer. Yeah. Oh, there's a name out of the past that most people have forgotten. Look, and for the listeners, look up Charles Dyer when you have a chance. Interesting, uh, interesting case study about political prisoners. But God. yeah, it's <laughs> but but yeah, it's it's rather fascinating, isn't it? It's like it's like whoever's the current. I mean, even Lavoy Finnegan is a martyr. Hell, I'm transcribing all of his videos, and like I've been asking for help behind the scenes on that, and now I'm just putting it right in the transcripts. Like, please help me. Here's my email address. Just get help me get a rough transcript and. Yeah, you're right. I, you don't need any hands. I don't need any hands to count the number of people helping me with that. I'm just no, saying, you know. Yeah. So he's so he, so Lavoy Finnegan has become the Freddie Gray of the Patriot movement. But who's helping me transcribe the relatively small amount of, for lack of a better term, literature? Basically, his videos. Who's helping me transcribe that? Oh, wait a minute. So you have all these fanboys, whether it's for Finnegan, you know, the whole Stand By Me rallies. So people will see that's kind of awful too, isn't it? That kind of goes back to reformism in terms of like protesting and such. They'll go to the rallies, the Stand By Me rallies. They'll do that, but they won't actually do any direct action. They won't do any actual real work as far as I can tell. They'll, so they'll, yeah, Lavoie they'll, they'll just, is our martyr. Yeah, Lavoie Finnegan is our martyr. And then they'll, you know, <laughs> say the Bundys, we love the Bundys. But they're not doing any real work, whether it's transcription, whether it's judicial transparency, or any of this other stuff, where it's actual meat and potatoes. Yeah, the, 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 and I mean, I, I see this all the time too. I, I'm still friends with a lot of those folks on Fascist Book. I've unfollowed most of them because they they like Trump now. But uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, the, they'll they'll go to the court proceedings and they'll say, okay, here's what happened at court. And I've come on a few of them. Like, uh, have you got any documents or anything? And like, no, this is just what I saw there. And it's like, well, your reports. Aren't court documents? I don't give a shit what you saw. Get yeah, me the court documents, or leave it at like, or or don't report it. It's 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 worthless if it's just your subjective opinion. We don't know what the hell the government's saying. And who knows? Maybe even if there was no opinion, they're acting strictly as a witness. Maybe they miss some stuff. You know, human fallibility. That's why there's yeah. a record button. And oh, by the way, does anybody know if you can bring a camera into the? Uh, into the uh, proceedings and actually tape them because the guys if, if you if you tips. if you can yeah yeah if you can no one pursued that in oregon as far as i know right and and i don't think anybody made an issue of oh well it's illegal i don't think anybody's ever said anything about that so i know for certain that the guys in Keene, new hampshire regularly film the court proceedings there so yeah. what's the deal here with uh the C4CF defendants. I mean, our federal, you know, district court uh, trials. I think it's, this is at the district level, not appellate. Uh, are, are are they not allowed to film? Does anybody even know? Did anybody even try? <laughs> Did anybody get arrested over it? I mean, that's happened in the past too, in some areas. But I don't think the Patriots even made the effort. So you know, it's it's just kind of like, I don't like this whole fanboy thing, Shane, where people will pick somebody whether it's a Charles Dyer or a Lavoy Finnicum or these C4CF guys, they put them up as these messianic figureheads and say they're wonderful and all that, 
But then when it comes to actually getting facts, evidence, whether it be in the form of footage, transcripts, court documents, whatever the form the evidence is, it's just, you know, you can hear the whistling wind. It's really pathetic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. And I want to make this point specifically. I mean, yeah, journalification was not was was not even in play here uh, with with the uh, Malior seven, the ones that that uh, were found not guilty. Uh, but I just want to make I, I guess kind of put these two things out there for for the uh, anarchists and libertarians uh, that uh, uh, that that still really really like the idea of journalification. Uh, now, obviously, uh, I was I was summoned summoned to a uh, uh, summoned onto a jury. It was actually the week of May tenth last year. I remember it very distinctly. It was uh, uh, it was uh, two days before or two days uh, two days before the week of my birthday. So yeah, I remember it very clearly. And uh, so yeah, I, I I served on a jury, and I, I had to uh, wait uh, until I was summoned. I'm, I'm not a, I wasn't a fan of journalification then. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, you have to wait to be summoned and you, you could wait a year, you could wait 10 years, you could wait 20 years, or you may never get summoned to be on a jury. That's I the first problem. I haven't, I haven't been summoned ever. So yeah, but, but yeah, your experience was fascinating, especially with that felony scratching case, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 and, and uh, I'm not I'm not going to go into that here, but uh, if you want to check that out, I have an Adventures in Illinois Law series. Uh, just uh, go to libertyunderattack.com and just uh, just uh, search on the site "felony scratching." You'll find it. It's a very comical article, uh, except for the lady that got locked up for that. That's uh, obviously not a, not not a good thing. She, I, I don't know. The the punishment didn't fit the crime. We'll just leave it at that for for, for now. But uh, so yeah, first off, you have to wait to be summoned. You can't take the initiative uh, yourself like you can with direct action. And secondly. The case you're on has to be a victimless crime, essentially. If there's a victim, uh, then uh, I mean, I, 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 like, uh, uh, like, like even even with this lady, I mean, yeah, she she scratched somebody. Do I think she deserved two or four years, whatever whatever the whatever the punishment was? No, I think she she might she like I I, I think the punishment would have fit better if it was like maybe 30 days in jail or uh, hell, I don't know, something a lot less than what she got. But we but we we didn't have a say on on what the uh, sentencing was. Did this person? Right. Did, did she actually do it? Yes. Well, that's all we got to determine. Uh, so uh, those those are the two main issues. But there was an identifiable. Hand. But there was an identifiable victim in that case. Yes, right? it was the nurse. Exactly. And yes. so, and I would also say that regarding the C four C F guys, just to play devil's advocate for a minute. Um, yeah, I mean the charge itself does say officers of the United States. So there is a potential, or let me put it this way, an identifiable potential victim. Okay, this is again, this isn't simple possession of cannabis. Okay, this isn't some, uh, you know, you drove, you know, you drove on the public highways without a driver's license. Okay, this isn't anything like that. There actually are spe specific individuals that are being identified, or specific types of individuals being identified, uh, even with 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 these types of charges. So. This isn't an issue of the law itself being challenged or let's just say nullified. No. This is an issue of did the fact you know did the facts you know fit the crime essentially? Did these defendants actually do it? And and the and <laughs> as you read from that, I think it was an email by the foreman. Uh, yeah, it's just no, they were just you know the facts didn't fit, and that's the end of it. I mean, it's like wow, you know, if the foreman said it, I think I would take him at his word at this point. Yeah. But no, the Patriots yeah. don't want to argue jury nullification because I don't know, they're bored. Like like the like the <laughs> I guess the acquittals were just not good enough for them. Those not not yeah. guilty verdicts. I mean, like wow, really? So it's and this is the problem too. I mean, it's it's in I don't want to say conspiracism necessarily, but it's a little bit like that in the sense of like the fallacious reasoning, the fallacies and, and just just incorrect, just wrong stuff that they're saying. Provably wrong too. And it's like, even when there is something resembling eh, a bit of a victory, right? Not all the C4CF guys are out. Only, a, what, a small handful of them are? Yeah, um, se yeah, seven out of, I mean, I, I think there were there were some that took plea agreements. And then I, I think there were, I think I was following 30 cases, at least almost 30 cases on the court documents archive. So, uh, yeah, there's still some, uh, there's, there's definitely, there's a trial in February for the other folks uh, uh, in Oregon. I think there's something around that time for the folks in Nevada, too, or yeah, something like that. I've, I've, I've lost track. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, actually, guys. I can, actually, I can confirm that. The trials uh, for the remaining C4CF defendants in Oregon, Oregon will actually be parallel to occurring simultaneously with the uh, the trials in Nevada regarding the events of the Bundy affair, the cattle and rustling that during April of 2014. So they actually did decide to do both during the same month and kind of, if I remember correctly, I think they're going to overlap at some points. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and it'll be interesting to see what what kind of plays out there. And, and I guess we'll we'll look, uh, I'll kind of provide just provide my closing thoughts here. Uh, but I, I saw some of the responses. I think there was, I think there was a, maybe Sheriff Ward. I, I don't know specifically, so so don't quote me on this. But I saw some stuff come across, and, and obviously the government officials weren't happy with the verdict. Uh, they were not happy with the verdict at all. And obviously the feds weren't either, considering they dumped so much money into that case, and they couldn't get these folks. Uh, and, uh, I guess my, my prediction and hell, we were wrong about this Kyle. So maybe, I don't know, maybe like, it's very possible that I may be wrong about what happens in Nevada, but, mm -hmm. uh, what I will say that they dumped all this money and all this time into it. I think that they're going to hammer those folks in Nevada. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not going to be good. Like well, they, not they, only they, that, yeah, but it's, it's also... going to be really bad. Yeah. Well, not only that, but it's also what, what Gary Hunt has called the legal shotgun. Uh, method where essentially what the government prosecutors do is they just tack on so many charges. So let's say hypothetically uh, they tacked on like 20. Well, even if you def even if you successfully defeat or otherwise you know an acquittal or not guilty of let's say hypothetically 18 of them, but you get found guilty <laughs> on two, well then you're still serving prison time, aren't you? So, yeah. so that legal shotgun is not to be underestimated. You mentioned a moment ago about uh, the different government agents. Gary Hunt wrote an article uh, not, uh, not too long ago entitled Burns Chronicles number 36, Words from the Poor Losers. And what he did was he actually collected what several of the different government agents said. And, and in closing here, I would like to read at least por portions of some of those. Um, Let's see, from the, hold on just one second. This is from, let's see, news release from FBI, United States Attorney's Office press release. Um, yeah, they basically said that, uh, oh yeah, although we are, uh, quote, although we are extremely disappointed in the verdict, we respect the court and the role of the jury in the American judicial system, uh, close quote. Let's go to another one. Um, this is straight from David Ward, the... Uh, Harney County Sheriff, uh, quote, while I am disappointed in the outcome, I believe our form of government and justice system to be the best in the world, close quote. Let's do another one. Uh, this is off of uh, Oregon Governor Kate Brown's uh, Twitter feed. Is that what it's called? Okay. Yep. Yep. That's um, it. <laughs> she said, uh, quote, while I respect the jury's decision, I am disappointed, close quote. So, okay, no, notice the pattern here. Oh, wait, oh, oh, at least, uh, yeah, one more. Uh, this is from Dan Ash, Director of uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Quote, while we are profoundly disappointed in the outcome of the trial, we are eager to move forward. Close quote. So notice there, you've got uh, two feds and two uh, state employees, uh, the governor and a county sheriff. You have the, you know, so both... Oregon government and federal government uh, agents both saying, we're so disappointed. Yeah. And it's like, okay, hold on a minute. You guys initially, like not too long ago, like what, a few months back, got like a whole slew of people pleading out who are now convicted felons, by the way. Yeah. And they're not going home to their families. So how come... You're not celebrating over that, but instead you'd rather focus on how disappointed. Oh, it's like crying crocodile tears. We're so disappointed. I mean, where does this come yeah. from? <laughs> In a sense, they've already had a victory. And not yeah, a they, Yeah, they, 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 they got some of their enemies. Yeah, some of their yep. enemies will be rotting away in prison when they come out, as, as has been the trend with some other folks. Once they get out, they probably won't want to have anything to do with the Patriot movement. Those right, wanna, and good luck. Those want to live their lives. And because now that they're felons, that now means they have a legal handicap. So, you know, good luck getting a loan, good luck renting an apartment, and probably most importantly, good luck getting a fucking job in this economy at being a convicted felon. Yeah. So yeah, no, what what, what do these what do these jackasses have to be disappointed about exactly? I'm not I'm not quite seeing the disappointment. Yeah, yeah, they 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 tossed out their net and they only got uh, instead of getting ten sharks they got uh, they they got two or three. They I mean, got yeah, something out of it. They got something out yeah. of it. What are they fucking crying about? Seriously, I mean, yeah. th th this is more like sore losers at this point, or or maybe I should say sore winners, maybe. <laughs> I don't. I, I think either either one of those uh, either one of those <laughs> works. But uh, uh, but yeah, I guess to, just to kind of close this out. I mean, I mean, yeah, journalification was not was not uh, involved in this whatsoever. So uh, whether it's the the anarchists or the uh, or the constitutionalists, 
Yeah, it wasn't involved in this whatsoever. They were judging the facts of the case. Uh, prosecution didn't bear their burden of proof, uh, so they yeah, they put forth a not guilty verdict, even though they didn't feel good about it. And they made and, and juror number four expressed that uh, in this uh, transcript, transcript, which I will link into uh, the show notes. But uh, any closing thoughts for you, Kyle? I would just say, you know, um, for those people who may want to consider using uh, civil defiance in the future, I would just suggest that before you guys start any sort of operational planning or, dare shall I say, the, the conspir forming the conspiracy, so-called, uh, you may want to first study what exactly happened uh, last January. Uh, I think the series, uh, Shane, I think we called it the Status Turf War, I yes. believe it was. Yep. I would suggest, Pete, the listeners really listen to those previous uh, episodes, those interviews that we did with Louie and so forth, and and really learn not just the mainstream version of events, but also a lot of other things that were happening, some of it behind the scenes that has now been made public, as well as other things that were public at the time and still are, uh, but that were not pushed by mainstream because uh, it suggested that there was more at play and that was getting a little too deep for them. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, guys, there's like 15 different informants that have now been outed you know, Terry Linnell being one of them. So if any of you guys decide to practice civil defiance at some point in the future, uh, just look at this case study and really weigh the risks. And vet your people. If you're tuning into this broadcast, freedom is obviously important to you. But unfortunately, whatever small fraction of freedom you have left is disappearing rapidly as Leviathanic governments continue to pass law after law, restricting your natural right to your person and property. You also know that freedom can't be won through the slave suggestion system known as politics. Things can seem hopeless, but freedom is more possible than you realize. Liberty Under Attack presents the Direct Action Series, your guide to finding freedom now without asking for permission. It includes over 40 hours of pure solutions presented to you in an advertisement-free format with bonus content. You can get your copy of the Direct Action Series for only $10. And while supplies last, you'll receive an LUA Voluntarist koozie for simply supporting LUA. What are you waiting for? Visit libertyunderattack.com backslash freedom now to secure your copy today. Again, libertyunderattack.com backslash freedom now. And make sure to tune in to LUA Radio Live at 7 p.m. Central every Thursday and Sunday on the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network. Get it up.